Uh, so Babak is a research scientist and also a manager at Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm AI Research here in Amsterdam. And uh, he's working on conditional computation and efficient image and video analysis. And before being in Qualcomm, he actually was uh, working on machine learning algorithms for breast cancer diagnosis in, also in the Netherlands, in Radboud University. And also he was visiting Harvard. And so we, we may talk about this a bit later. So uh, Babak, I'll leave you the floor with your talk. Skip. Sure, thank you very much for the introduction. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, can you see my slides? Oh yeah, I can see the slides. Right. I will I will do that before. Now I'll, I'll let you talk. Right. Yeah. Right. All right, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and tell you a little bit more about what we do in at Qualcomm. Uh, first of all, I want to start with a brief uh, introduction about Qualcomm itself as a company and the types of projects we do specifically in Amsterdam and the kind of university uh, relations we have. And at the end, I want to actually, I added some tips uh, that was gathered from um, some of my colleagues, which are doing a lot of interviews to give you uh, some tips about uh, the best practices for preparing the CV uh, or what to do on an uh, on-site virtual interview. So at Qualcomm, uh, I think we have been leading the mobile innovation for over 30 years now. And uh, we've been doing that by, uh, first of all, inventing technologies that have brought uh, basically digitization uh, into mobile communication first. And later on, we uh, redefined computing by connecting smartphones uh, to the internet for the first time. And then uh, with the era of 5G, um, now with the advancements that are being uh, created, we are trying to push this uh, innovation to literally uh, every industry such that everything becomes connected to everything. So when you wanna connect everything to everything, um, something that becomes very important is on-device intelligence. Uh, well, we know that one way of gathering intelligence is by using cloud system and cloud will always remain important. But uh, for the reasons such as privacy or reliability and latency, transmission efficiency and bandwidth utilization, I think on-device in intelligence is a thing that uh, will become the future. And for that reason, Qualcomm uh, is trying to bring AI components to all the chips that it uh, designs for various industries. So it can bring intel intelligence in this communication. So, that's about Qualcomm. Now I want to tell you about the type of research uh, that we do in the, in the Qualcomm company as a whole. Uh, first of all, there is a lot of, I think the company knows the value of research in general uh, a lot because a lot of revenue that is uh, that we are getting is through the patenting or licensing things rather than producing stuff. And for that, um, research is valued. And uh, in a lot of cases, such researchers have a three to 10 years uh, horizon uh, before being commercialized. Uh, of course, at the middle of all the works that we do is 5G. Uh, we don't do a lot of that in the Amsterdam office, but of course, um, that's uh, that's one of the main uh, uh, investments that Qualcomm is working on. And the next version of 5G, 6G, will uh, be the combination of 5G and AI, as they say. Uh, so there are a lot of um, basically uh, projects uh, associated with that, which also use AI actually. There is of course the deep learning side um, that I will cover uh, more extensively and uh, specifically about uh, what we do in Amsterdam, but there are projects working on autonomous driving um, and how to use AI for that. Or the other version, uh, I think V2X, which is vehicle to everything connection um, is another project that has a high importance and uh, uses a lot of AI deployment, as well as the extended reality projects, which is basically covering augmented reality and virtual reality. But now uh, I want to focus a little bit more about the type of projects we work on um, on the uh, Amsterdam office. Uh, so as you can see, we have eight main uh, tracks or teams uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, they're working on, uh, let's start with the first two, perception and a wireless AI team. Let, let me play this first demo, uh, which is the result of a, a team uh, which is running group equivariant CNNs um, on mobile devices for uh, cancer diagnosis um, of uh, breast tissue. 
And you can see uh, that they are running equivariant networks uh, and they are comparing it to conventional CNNs, uh, which yields significantly lower false positive and uh, false negatives. And this is ru running on mobile devices by itself. And in a lot of these uh, tracks, we really focus on um, creating an impact and not having the, a solution just for publishing, but also getting a result out of it and, and getting it actually to product at, uh, uh, as well. Another example I want to show is, the, is from the wireless AI team, which are focusing on um, tracking humans uh, in indoor environments using only the Wi-Fi signal. This is using unsupervised deep learning at the moment. Um, and this work was uh, uh, accepted at uh, NeurIPS 2021. So uh, apart from that, we have the XR team, which is focusing a lot on virtual reality and augmented reality uh, projects. Let me go to other, other uh, tracks as well. So that we have the model efficiency team. This is a demo that they have produced. Uh, so you, you see a semantic segmentation model. Uh, which is segmenting humans in this case. Uh, but uh, if you want to deploy directly on a mobile device, you have to quantize it, and it generally generates very poor results. And the authors of this work um, uh, developed a technique with, which would uh, quantize uh, the, the model without any drop in accuracy. Uh, another example I want to show is, uh, is actually the first example of a neural video decoding, uh, which is running uh, on a mobile device. So we, we are using um, deep learning to compress videos. And this is uh, this was uh, also at the time that Max Welling uh, was with us. And our team, of course, had a lot of uh, focus on using VAEs. And it shows how we can use uh, VAEs actually to compress videos. And this was the, the first example that we were able to show that you can um, compress videos real time on a, on a mobile device. There are other teams um, which are um, more ML focused. For example, the combinatorial optimization team is focusing on how to place different components of a chip, for example, transistors, uh, on, in, on, the, on the chip with an uh, optimal way. Or the personalization of federation for the learning team, which uh, is about learning uh, on device. And uh, this is a very recently uh, started uh, team uh, on causality and interactive learning. Um, um, and with that, um, I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, the kind of relations we have with academia um, at the moment. So we have been having a, a long lasting relationship with the um, uh, uh, TU Graz uh, University. Uh, which started in uh, 2016. And the focus of this relationship is on 3D computer vision. And uh, specifically, the XR and VR team uh, of ours have a very intensive collaboration with them. As you probably know, we have the Kuva team, uh, which is in collaboration with the University of Amsterdam. Um, and the focus there is on computer vision tasks, as well as machine learning focus, uh, focuses on generative modeling, distributed deep learning, and hyperparameter optimization. And we have three uh, key uh, investigators um, on Google Lab, Casey Snook, Professor um, uh, uh, Stratis Gavis, and uh, Max Welling. And of course, we regularly run uh, Kuva or Qualcomm UVA deep vision seminars as well, which you're always welcome to, to join. Apart from this, uh, we have the Qualcomm Innovation Fellowship Program, which we um, fund uh, or recognize and reward a PhD student with, with innovative uh, ideas. And we also provide a one year mentorship uh, to them by bringing by bringing an industry perspective into their project. And uh, if you're enrolled in one of these universities, you can definitely apply. Uh, you can see Fry University in the list. Um, uh, so they, they are eligible for applying. Uh, VU is not, because we, we already have a very intense um, collaboration with them. Um, so there are other ways, obviously, if you are at VU, uh, at, at the, um, uh, sorry, at uh, UVA to, to collaborate with us. And actually, next, I wanted to give you, uh, as a person who has come from um, academia into industry, I wanted to give you some of my perspectives on how I compare 
research in academia and research in industry. Um, there is no way one is better than the other, but I wanted to highlight some of the differences uh, in my opinion. I think research in academia has a lot of nice benefits. You have to the freedom to dictate your own schedule. Um, you have higher chance of um, basically making individual impacts. So you, you can say, I want to work on this specific topic, publish a paper and be, become very well known on that and regularly publish on that area. T uh, timelines tend to be longer. I don't mean uh, that you don't have deadlines. Of, of course, we have always the deadlines of writing grants or uh, conferences. But you're not uh, you're not instructed by a boss on top of you that tells you this is a deadline and you have to get, generate a result by then. Uh, but there are some limitations, like uh, the common saying that you have to obtain fine funding and publish or perish in academia. And uh, one thing that is a limitation and one of the motivations of many people coming to industry is that you may struggle to have your ideas adapted in uh, in practice. In comparison to that, in industry, I think um, uh, compared to that freedom that you may have here, you are really working towards a shared goal. So uh, the goals are set in advance and it could be, um, for example, you are going to do video compression. You, are, you have the flexibility to work on whatever um, direction you want to solve the problem, but uh, you really have a shared goal and cannot change the task by itself. I think in, in industry, one thing that becomes extremely crucial is how you communicate and your personal skills uh, to manage projects. Uh, that is extremely important because you have to frequently talk to stakeholders, to, to VPs, uh, to promote your research and, and get their attention that this is an important thing. And this is maybe in contrast to applying for grants in, uh, in academia. And uh, generally, some of the benefits is that uh, career opportunities are higher for industry. Uh, you, you probably have better computational powers and higher salaries uh, in industry. And recently, you are seeing that a lot of um, companies are doing more research. And the distinction between research in academia and, and industry is getting increasingly blurred. Um, and you do see a lot of university industry relationships. Uh, professors are increasingly offered dual roles um, to be part-time in the company and part-time uh, continuing to supervise, for example, PhD students. And uh, increasingly, we are allowed to set our own agenda to work our own research uh, interests, as long as it is, of course, aligning with the goals of the company. And um, of course, another benefit is conducting research at a corporate lab means less time uh, chasing grants. And of course, at the end, it really um, depends on yourself. You have to really set your priorities, think about how you want to spend your time, know your strengths, and factor in your personality, which of these personality traits works uh, for industry or academia. And also try to think long term, but know that the options are not going to be limited after you make a choice. For example, if you decide to continue and do a postdoc in academia. It doesn't mean that you will you are not welcome in industry and vice versa. You can come to industry. We have had uh, colleagues who uh, came to, uh, to us and worked with us, but then decided to go back and become, for example, associate professors, um, uh, for example, uh, Frey University. So that is that option is always uh, open. And I want to end with some, some of the tips that I gathered um, together with my colleagues that, were, uh, that are often reviewing uh, a lot of CVs, that what counts and what things you should be taking, taking in, into account uh, when you want to apply for a, a job in, uh, in the industry. I think a lot of companies are uh, right now using NLPs. Uh, so it's very important to look at the job descriptions and put in the right keywords um, uh, in your CV. Uh, don't, ma don't make a generic a resume and send it to all. Definitely ta tailor that for the specific job application. And uh, the resume in, uh, for the industry generally should be a around one to two page. Uh, that's definitely pre uh, preferred. And uh, I do see a lot of CVs which are super cluttered. That makes it extremely hard uh, to focus on the essence of the work. So simple and 
and clean templates uh, leave a very good, much better impression. Uh, of course, links at the top of the resume from your GitHub or uh, LinkedIn. And if you don't have a lot of uh, work experience, uh, for example, if you're a fresh graduate, try to describe some of your relevant projects. Cover letters, we don't ask for it, but uh, a lot of companies still do. Then you have to describe who you are, what you're looking for, and what, what is it that you bring to the table for that company. And don't list unnecessary personal leaders in general. Um, so this, I already said, um, uh, some of the things that you should really pay, uh, pay attention when you are doing a virtual on-site uh, on interview, I think uh, try to think out loud when you're responding to a question. Don't be silent because a lot of time the interviewer wants to understand how it feels like to be actually brainstorming with you. Uh, be genuinely curious and ask a lot of questions and be to the point while responding to questions because the interviewer can easily uh, understand if you are going away to your comfort zone uh, and deviating from the problem. Some companies give puzzles. Uh, don't be afraid of asking for him hint if you're stuck. Dress halfway decently and use an uncluttered, uncluttered background uh, free of distraction, maybe a little bit nicer than mine. Uh, uh, so, and here are some links. Uh, we have a lot of internship opportunities and full-time positions. Um, and uh, you can also drop me an email uh, if you have uh, any questions about the positions. And with that, I'm very excited to hear your questions. Thank you, Babak. And I, I didn't expect the, the last two slides, but I took notes. They are fantastic. I think they will send them to you know all my friends and students. Very useful. Sure. And uh, I think. Um, in the meantime, we're, we're waiting for questions. So some other, some other person was clapping in the question. So, but uh, in the meantime, maybe I'll start by asking you maybe about the, the typical questions I ask everybody. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, uh, actually, I was looking at your CV and you, you are from Iran, but you did study in Sweden. And then for some reason, you came to the Netherlands. And uh, then you, you were even away one year, but you still came back and still you are in Amsterdam now. So I wanted to ask you, why did you choose Amsterdam? I think that's, uh, I have to ask the question. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. So I, first, I went to Sweden. Uh, at the time, education, masters were free. So it was a very good uh, opportunity. I went there and studied computer science with a focus on medical um, imaging. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I worked on AI on my thesis and became very interested in AI for medicine. And at a time when I was searching at different groups, I saw that Netherlands is particularly strong in AI for medical imaging. The group in uh, Nijmegen was uh, very well known, as well as like Erasmus MC uh, or uh, the group in Utrecht University. So I decided to come. Um, I went to US, yes, uh, at Harvard. And uh, I think uh, Boston is the closest city European city you get in uh, in US. Uh, oh, I agree. I also lived in Boston for one year and a half. I completely agree. Sure. Yes, definitely. And I love that city, by the way. Mm -hmm. Well, when I came back, I I definitely uh, knew that I uh, love Netherlands uh, more for staying long term as well. And uh, and then I decided to uh, find a position after that. And and Qualcomm was at the time known in, in the computer vision society. They were the winners of ImageNet, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and I came there and uh, I knew about the AI talents that are, uh, are there in, in, uh, in Amsterdam and the very nice ecosystem. I just found a huge group of AI-related friends. So now my circle of AI friends is like enormous. Uh, so I'm very happy with my, uh, with my choice now. And also, I think your offices are in the campus, right? In the Matrix building. Yes. So you're actually yeah. in the UVA campus, the University of Amsterdam campus. Yeah, yeah. That's, so it it always very, has a... Very connected, you, no? Exactly. University-wide, uh, basically, when we are working at uh, Qualcomm. OK. So um, OK, I'll just continue with my question. So I think, well, you already partially answered. So I'm asking you your personal reasons for being in Amsterdam. But maybe you have also other reasons that you think young researchers you know, that they, maybe they're starting now, they want to do a PhD, or, or in your case, maybe they want to be a research engineers or, you know, like research scientists, why should they come to Amsterdam? 
And let's say maybe not necessarily only Qualcomm, but maybe Qualcomm too. Yes, yeah, definitely. So I think one of the reasons I, I do see Amsterdam as a new uh, AI hub in, uh, in Europe at the moment. Uh, I think UK is one of the hubs for sure, but in EU, um, Amsterdam is, is, is one that is really growing. Uh, you can, I think one of the major reasons is because of these two universities and the amazing professors that we have that are educating these talents. As soon as these are educated, uh, all these industries are, are uh, focusing to attract these uh, basically talents. You see Qualcomm, see Google Brain, now Microsoft. Exactly. Uh, yes. You see them having joint labs uh, like Bosch Lab, Kuvo Lab, or Philips Lab. Mm -hmm. So you, you do see that uh, industries are understanding this. So it is turning into a hub. You do see UVA um, uh, um, turning into a center of excellence by Ellis program, for example, that Maxwell yes. is a chair of. Or yes. the, and gradually, I think the government is, and the, the entire organization of Amsterdam is becoming uh, impressed by, by this presence and the, uh, the opportunities it's bringing. And I heard of this AI Tech for People initiative, and they are investing yes. $1 billion dollars uh, to educate even uh, new students, bring more capacities, make sure that professors have salaries enough that they can stay in academia, which is, uh, which is I think, extremely important. I, I kind of advocated for, for industries so that, like, I, I'm being a little bit biased, uh, a little bit biased that you can it, also... It's fine, it's fine. I mean, I'm 20% with IBM, so everything is fine. Yes, yes. I'm one of the dual position people you oh, mentioned. Okay. You can be in both. Excellent. Yes, indeed. But I think we really need to invest uh, at universities a lot. We have to have our professors educating PhD students, otherwise uh, industries will, will not get them, of course. So I think the investment should be on both sides. And I think the government is realizing that. that. And I think because of the, the good ecosystem we have, uh, I mean, the good universities, they are really realizing that. And I think that makes Amsterdam a special place right now. Yeah. Okay, sounds yeah. fantastic. I think we're actually on time. So, uh, so thank you again for the talk and, yeah, and the fact, like, especially the last two slides. I think if you don't mind, I will share them with my students. I hope you're fine. Sure, sure, them. absolutely. They were, they were very useful. Uh, and uh, okay, so I want to thank all of the speakers. So I want to thank Mostafa, Ilaria, Senai, and Baba all together. Fantastic speeches. And so I think um, this generally concludes our session today so i hope you had fun and i think there is another session tomorrow not on talent so you know the i tech, tech weeks continues so sure. uh, thank you everybody bye yeah thank you sarah and colleagues for organizing this next event thank you yeah. bye bye, -bye.